All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us and, and for waiting there. Uh, had a few more people trickle in, so that was good. Uh, um, we're here today to talk about uh, saving some money on, on AWS. Uh, there's lots of information out cost optimization methods and techniques, uh, and um, we're here to talk about some of those and some common uh, what I call gotchas or pitfalls or issues that you can encounter on the way to um, optimizing your uh, account. So uh, to get started here, uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Mike Boudreau. I'm the Director of Cloud Optimization here at Mission. We're a leading AWS consulting and managed services provider. Um, my background is in cloud architecture and sales, and for the past six years I've been focusing on cost optimization on AWS. Uh, I'm obsessed with efficiency, and I love to talk about technology, uh, and I'm a foodie on top of all that. So um, uh, that's uh, about it for me. Um, next up, uh, a little intro to mission. Um, we like to call this our ammo. Uh, we're an advanced consulting partner and provider, provider with AWS uh, with offices in L.A. and Boston. And um, we focus on architecting, migrating, managing, and optimizing our customers' infrastructure on AWS. We have 100% uh, AWS certified tech staff uh, with over 30 professional certs and 40 engineers that are working 24-7 um, across several departments uh, to provide support uh, for our customers. <clears throat> and we're also a Well Architect Review launch partner and an AWS Immersion Day partner. We've uh, recently been ranked number six on CRN's Fast Growth 150 list. Um, and also ranked number 13 on the Channel E2E Top 100 MSPs list. Uh, so we're growing and, and, um, and making waves here and providing some good services to our customers. Um, and speaking of, here's a few of those. Uh, we have a, a strong focus on some particular verticals in, in media and entertainment, SaaS applications, uh, Windows workloads, and game tech. Um, and we have customers from all different sizes, ranging from smaller shops to enterprises, as you can see here. So before we get into the nitty-gritty of today's <clears throat> excuse me, conversation, uh, I wanted to um, give you kind of an overview of our services that kind of positions the cloud optimization service that we have. So we provide uh, a comprehensive suite of services, um, and, and we're available 24-7 for our customers. We provide managed cloud services, uh, which includes application performance management and security management as well. Uh, we also are pioneers in a managed DevOps model, uh, and we pr have a professional services division that provides uh, one-off project support. Uh, we have the cloud optimization services is available as well, and we're also a partner-led. Um, we, we provide AWS partner-led support, and we're an AWS reseller. So, cloud optimization. Uh, this, the cloud optimization service has a few levels that in, in starts off with our our uh, basic level for uh, reseller customers. Doesn't cost anything. But the goal of all of, all of our services, um, of all of our cost optimization services, is to help our customers gain insight into their cloud spend uh, and be able to use that, that insight um, to, to form um, some, some recommendations and, and to inform decisions on, on how to uh, reallocate your spend, know where your money is going, and find regular optimization opportunities for, for the customers. So, getting into um, the topic of today, uh, you'll you'll probably find a lot of information out there already about cost optimization methods. There are several tried and true <clears throat> um, methods available, and they uh, th you can find lots of information on those. So I'm not going to really go into much about uh, uh, really much about what these actually are, um, as much as um, saying that, you know, finding out ways that you might run into issues with these. 
Um, people generally start with reserved instances because that's the biggest uh, potential savings in a lot of uh, customers' accounts. Um, and then they also do right sizing, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, instance scheduling, so turning in instances on and off so to save money. Uh, and then they'll go into looking for zombie resources, which are un underutilized or unused resources. Um, and then they might try to architect for savings after that. Um, there's no real set method on which way is best, but um, in my opinion, this is actually kind of wrong. Um, so th the way we look at things here is that the first thing that you actually should do in cost optimization is security. Um, and that may seem like an unusual way to start off cost optimization, but if you're optimizing your architecture, um, that's going to be kind of pointless if you don't have proper security controls in place. Uh, you can use things, native tools in AWS to, um, to set up uh, monitors and notifications about uh, resources being spun up in, in unused regions. Um, you, you can have, you know, you have to make sure that your account is secure so that nobody can get in unauthorized and start spinning up resources or somebody in your account that actually should have access to your account uh, spinning up resources that they shouldn't be. Um, it's happened many of times, I'm sure you've all heard about it, Bitcoin mining on, on your employer's dime kind of thing has happened a lot, so we've seen that. Um, and there's ways to monitor that kind of usage and put guardrails on. So um, following CIS best practices, the Center for Internet Security, um, that's one of the ways to uh, prevent those kinds of things from happening. And it, so it, it makes it very much a cost optimization um, method. So after, cost, after security, the next thing that we actually try to do <clears throat> is to work on fault tolerance issues. So this is similar to security. If your app is down, does it really matter how much money you're saving on infrastructure, right? So in order to make this a, a real cost optimization opportunity, designing for failure, um, using multiple availability zones to prevent your site from going down if an availability zone goes down, uh, making AMIs for all of your instances, and then uh, and including maybe starting from a golden image, so you just have a standard set image to start from. And then that will enable automation, including auto-scaling. Um, so if you're using auto-scaling, it's, it's good to use that, even if you have uh, just one, one server um, serving your site or your application, you can use auto-scaling for auto-healing, uh, for self-healing. Um, if, if the instance becomes unavailable, you can set your minimum and maximum uh, instances to one in your auto-scaling group, and it will automatically uh, heal that, that server when it goes down, and your site won't be down as long. Okay. So next, we actually do get into the real cost optimization uh, activities, but um, I do it in a different order. I suggest doing it in a different order um, so that you are not making mistakes along the way or costing yourself money. Uh, so first, we suggest doing right sizing and right typing. Uh, what is that? So that's analyzing the performance metrics to make sure that you're using the right instance sizes and families, the right instance types, for the applications that you're running. Um, you don't want to be running a compute-intensive uh, uh, application on a memory uh, dedicated or a memory optimized instance. Um, so knowing which instance size and which type to, to run on and including generation to run on uh, will help you avoid unnecessary costs. Um, and when you're making these analy analysis uh, of your instances, don't forget to include the, the memory um, of those instances. Out of the box, AWS does not provide memory metrics for their EC2 instances. The only way to get those is to install an agent. And there are several third-party ones. You can use CollectD, and there are other uh, third-party tools that do it. Um, but you can, now AWS has made available a CloudWatch memory agent that actually tracks the memory statistics, but also disk usage statistics and some other ones as well. So you can make those available to your, uh, to your analysis engines uh, if you're using a third-party tool or something else. 
um, then you can make sure you include that that memory agent uh, the memory data in your analysis. Um, and then for newer generations, this is one of those things that you'll not really realize until you do this a couple of times. Um, it's one of those issues. Um, newer generations, in in general. Uh, they are usually cheaper and more performant. Um, when AWS releases a new generation of instances, it usually has faster processors, uh, more RAM, or not more RAM, sorry, but better performance overall. Um, and they also usually reduce the cost. So it's kind of a double win if you move up to those new generations um, at the same size that you're at, you get better performance for lower cost. But that's not always the case. Um, since Windows does per core licensing, there has been times when AWS has uh, updated their instance sizes, uh, sorry, instance generations, and the new generation has more cores, uh, same same number of CPUs but more cores, um, and that has increased the the cost of of upgrading to that generation. Um, so be careful and look out for things like that. Uh, but in general. Uh, per core, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, updating to newer generations is going to save you money. All right, after you do your right sizing and right typing, um, before you do any reservations at this point, I suggest doing your instance scheduling. Um, and that's determining which instances you, you can keep, uh, you can turn off overnight or when they're not being used. And we suggest doing this in advance because this actually will save you more money than making a reservation, especially if your uh, accounting department is stingy with the upfront um, payments option. Um, the, the no upfront options on AWS for EC2 generally save you somewhere in the range of like 26 to 32 percent. Um, if, uh, if you're able to turn off your instances overnight um, for 12 hours a night, for example, and then uh, over the weekend as well, um, say for your dev instances, then you're going to be uh, turning those instances off for about 108 hours out of 168 in a week. Um, and that's about, a, I think it's roughly a 65% savings. Um, so that's clearly going to get you, save you more money than using reservations on those instances um, and, <clears throat> and uh, getting just the 30 to 32% off. Um, so if, if you do this, uh, there are third-party tools you can do it. You can use Lambda functions, things like that. Uh, so, but I suggest automating it so that somebody doesn't forget to turn it off when they leave or leave it on over the weekend unnecessarily. Um, the third-party tools you can use, uh, they uh, will have scheduling as well. And some of them you are able to use a default state of off. Um, and that's going to be useful. If you have a default state of off, then the, cu the person who needs to use that instance can come into work, uh, uh, snooze that, the, the default state, and have it turn on for uh, eight hours. They can say, hey, I'm going to be here for eight hours or 10 hours today. And at the end of that time, you can turn this off. Uh, so that way, it will automatically turn it off, and you don't have to remember to do it at the end of the day. All right. So after that, we finally get to reserved instances, which is where other people really start. Um, but so we've done our right sizing and right typing. We've determined which instances can be scheduled. Um, so then we get our reservations. We're saving money now, but our work is not done. And this is one of the common issues that we've seen with our customers uh, that come to us that are have costs running away. They don't have it. They they bought their RIs, but they aren't seeing the savings that they thought they would. So a lot of times what happens is that after they buy the RIs, they forget about it. Um, money. But if there's any changes in their account, they're not monitoring their utilization of those RIs to know if uh, they're being used completely. So if you end up changing an instance size to a larger one, um, it may proportionally still apply to the new instance size, but it's not going to be completely covered. If you change it to a smaller one, then there may be some of that reservation that's going unused. Um, sometimes you may change to a different instance altogether, a different group comes in, or something happens in your update, you forget that you have the RIs, 
and um, then they become, suddenly become an extra expense that you're not getting anything out of. So make sure that you're monitoring utilization of your RIs. Also, AWS does not provide a way to get notifications um, about expiring RIs, uh, and there's no mechanism to automatically renew them. Um, so um, I suggest setting a reminder in your calendar as soon as you buy the RIs. Make sure that, <clears throat> that you give yourself maybe 30 days notice um, to plan any upgrades to the instances so that when you get to the time that your instances expire, you have the work plan to update to the new instance size or type, uh, and then you can purchase reservations quickly again after that work is done so you're not running on demand very much. Uh, and then finally, don't forget about the other reservation options. There's actually, you know, RDS is pretty well known. A lot of our customers don't realize that you can buy reserved uh, usage for ElastiCache, DynamoDB, and Redshift as well. Uh, and there's considerable savings to be had there. So um, make sure you're doing that as well. Consider those options. All right. So next, the, what people call zombie resources. Now, the, the, um, the thing with the zombie resources, it's kind of a, uh, something that's an issue, you're a, a, a gotcha all along. It's that the benefit of the cloud allows you to spin up things easily for dev purposes, or if you're troubleshooting an issue and, and um, you need to spin up a copy of an instance, you can do that real fast, but often that, those instances and the, and the volumes attached to them become forgotten. Even if you turn the instance, instance, but uh, the, um, the volumes that are attached to that you're still paying for. Uh, and we've had cases where customers have had um, about $5,000 in unused EBS for over two years um, that nobody was keeping track of. So um, this can be uh, a really uh, get away from, from, uh, from people and the cost can um, be considerable if you're not paying attention. Um, so uh, look for things like these um, unused or um, EDS or RDS, uh, EC2 or RDS instances, sorry, um, from those testing dev environments or um, troubleshooting work, things like that. Also, if you're taking, uh, if you have a, a ma an automated backup plan, you're getting your snapshots taken care of. Um, and then likewise, those tools that do that, they usually have a way to uh, weed out the old instances and terminate them when they become you know, too old for your specific use case. So after 30 days, terminate any snapshots because they're not useful to us. So if you're taking a snapshot because, a manual snapshot, um, because you're trying to uh, uh, upgrade an instance or do something, some work on uh, investigating an issue or something like that, those manual snapshots do not get automatically deleted. Uh, they're not part of the the, the automations, uh, the automated program system, so they don't know to go in and delete those old snapshots. So make sure you're going in and finding those old manually created snapshots and delete those. Um, like I said, when you delete something, the EBS volume is still there, um, and and also the sometimes the um, Elastic IPs still stick around. If you don't release those, then AWS charges you a small fee for those. I think it's like three sixty five a month. Um, for Elastic IPs. All right. So the last one here is kind of a, a, a general um, kind of a catch-all for other things. Um, AWS allows you to tag your infrastructure, and, and I think a lot of people have heard about this. Uh, they, they may realize that it's good for some of their, their own internal tracking purposes, but it's also incredibly useful for tracking your costs. Um, you can use several tags per instance. I think there is, I think maybe 50 tags are available per instance um, or per resource in AWS. So you can tag link things for uh, owner and team and product environment, um, uh, you know, business unit, and then various um, various you know tags like that, and then. Tools like um, the AWS Cost Explorer or third-party 
cloud management platforms like Cloud Checker or Cloud Health, um, they can use those tags to slice and dice your data, and you can get very fine-grained detail about where your costs are going. So um, don't forget that if you're using tags, um, to, to use those to, as, a, as a cost savings um, opportunity as well. Uh, it allows you to, you know, the more tags you have, the more visibility you have into your environment. Um, uh, uh, other than that, the, the automation is something that we talked about earlier. Um, using automation is really taking advantage of the promise of the cloud. Uh, it, it eliminates waste and reduces human error. So um, if you're not using automation because you maybe did a lift and shift to the cloud, uh, then maybe um, uh, you should look into you know, automation to, to, to refactor your app. Now that you're in the cloud, see how you can automate it to, to your, automate your, um, your processes and, and systems in the cloud. Uh, and, <clears throat> um, and then you'll be able to uh, you know, get, a, get a hold on your spend, um, and you'll be able to really move much faster in the cloud. Uh, then, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> um, some other things when you're architecting for savings, uh, when you're doing those multiple availability zones, which is good for fault tolerance, it adds a level of of complexity um, and also a potential level of additional costs. Um, and so, if you're doing that for, um, like I said, for multiple availability zones or for um, NAT instances, uh, then you can incur, incur additional answer costs that you didn't expect to incur. So uh, go ahead, you know, if you're going to do something like that, which I do suggest doing, make sure you are tracking your costs and finding ways to uh, reduce the amount of crosstalk between your instances and different availability zones to prevent um, or per, between different regions to prevent um, uh, additional costs. Um, and then finally, now that you've done all of this optimization for your, uh, for your current generation of your application, start considering how to, um, how to architect the next generation. If you can't take advantage of some of these opportunities now, or if you can't take advantage of things like serverless features and uh, uh, services in AWS, um, you know, like Lambda, or, or take advantage of containerization or anything like that, start thinking now about architecting your next generation of your app. Um, and that way, you'll be better equipped to, uh, to reduce your costs and, and architect for the savings that are available there. All right. So. We have uh, gone through that. This is my revised list for the order that you should go in. So not only did we go through a few um, uh, gotchas along the way, um, we're actually reordering the, the, um, the, the uh, sorry, reorganizing the order in which you should go through um, these savings opportunities. So first, always start off with security. If you're not secure, it really doesn't matter how much money you're saving. Same thing with fault tolerance. If your site goes down, it doesn't matter. Then after that, you can get into your right sizing, instant scheduling, making sure that you're using the right size resources, and then turning the ones off that don't need to be used all the time. After that, you can reserve your instances, uh, and then make sure that you're tracking those reservations, the utilization of those, and the, the ex expiration of those as well, and look into other services if you're using RDS. Elasticash, DynamoDB, or Redshift. Then after that, you can go after your zombie resources, uh, and then um, architect for savings after that. All right. So we're going to pause for a brief uh, Q&A here, before a brief Q&A here. Um, I did see a couple of questions already come in. Um, and uh, so we'll take those questions. Feel free to type additional ones in the in the um, in the bo text box there, and we'll get them answered. So I'm going to take a brief. I think we're about 45 or 50 seconds delayed. So I'm going to take a brief pause here to give you guys the chance to answer some or ask some questions, and then we'll take uh, take them as they come in.
Okay, uh, so we did have a couple of questions come in. Uh, the first one uh, says, <clears throat> when upgrading to newer generations, have you run into any other issues? Um, yeah, so a little more complicated than the ones that we went over, but there are some others. Um, when you're when you're upgrading um, from older generation instances to newer ones, sometimes the technologies underlying those instances change. Um, so in the past, I have issues uh, from moving from the third generation instances um, to fourth and or fifth generation instances, two different kinds of issues. One of them was the elastic network adapter. If you were going to upgrade to an a instance that could take care of that, you needed a driver for that. So, just, so a, a quick cycling of your instance didn't include that, so it wouldn't work. Um, so you would have to install the, the elastic network adapter driver um, as part of your upgrade process. So be careful for things like that. Um, and then the other one I saw was um, when upgrading from uh, third to a fourth, uh, third to fourth or fifth generation instances. Uh, in the third generation, AWS provided an option to use para-virtualized or hardware virtualized machines. Uh, and those are just two different virtualization technologies um, that had various performance benefits. Um, and uh, the when they released the fourth generation and subsequent generations of instances, they no longer offered para-virtualized as an option. And what happens is people were trying to upgrade from the third generation to the fourth generation, realized that they couldn't do it by simply cycling their instance like they normally would. So it's not, it's not a trivial task to just turn off your instance and turn it back on as a new one. So the, there, was a, a, there was a lot of discussion online about the, the method a, a, a potential method to um, to upgrade those instances, and so you can Google that and find the actual method. If you have some PV instances that can't be upgraded, there are some posted uh, steps online to um, to get those upgraded to newer generations. Okay, uh, so there's another one. Um, there are no instances in DynamoDB, so what are you reserving? Ah, right. So, um, yeah, reserved instances became kind of the name for everything because that's what they started with was EC2 and then RDS, and those were referred to as instances. Um, but for DynamoDB, it's just the tables. So you're actually reserving read capacity units and write capacity units. Um, and, a, and a read capacity and write capacity unit um, covers a, a, um, a request to read or write a certain amount of data, per, um, a certain size of data, and, and the number of requests that you can do in a second. Um, so if you were, you can reserve um, in chunks of 100 capacity units. So whether it's read or write, you reserve in chunks of 100. Uh, so if it would include, you know, if you did 100, you would include 100 writes of a, up to one kilobyte in size. Um, and I think it's one kilobyte, and then the reads is four kilobytes in size. I may have that reversed. Uh, so um, you're actually reserving the throughput, um, the, uh, the, the reads and writes on those uh, on DynamoDB. All right. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, so if any more pop up before I'm done, I'll make sure and pop back in to, uh, to pull those out and answer those. Um, before we go, just wanted to wrap up by saying, uh, you know, how can we help you? Um, do you need help with cost, uh, cost optimization? Or are you looking for 24-7 cloud support? Are you interested in DevOps automation and getting help with accelerating your DevOps um, uh, uh, adoption? Um, we also have an, uh, an opportunity for our customers to speak to um, uh, to an AWS solutions architect, one of our certified solutions architects for free. Um, so if you have questions and, and want to get those answered and you want to talk to somebody who has a lot of experience on AWS, 
<clears throat> then feel free to contact us at sales at missioncloud.com and, and we'll get you set up with a free essay on demand session. All right. I don't see any other additional questions from from you guys. So thank you guys very much for showing up. Uh, we are um, we're we're here to answer your questions and help in any way we can. So feel free to reach out. Don't forget to download the um, attachments that are in the attachments section of the of the Bright Talk page. Uh, it includes, like I said, a some. Uh, a case study and a data sheet on our services and then an overview of, uh, of mission as well. So once again, thank you all for uh, showing up and um, feel free to reach out if you need anything. Take care.